ensures the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in praise and worship and in glorification of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and our families over this past day and providing for all of our logistical grace needs, giving us all the things necessary to go forward in your spiritual plan and will for our lives. And especially, Father, giving us your word and the filling of the Holy Spirit that empowers us and strengthens us. And Father, we ask that you lead us in the word that we have this evening to Again, penetrate our souls and then apply it as we go about our day so that ultimately we are glorifying you more and more. And Father, we continue to pray for our great nation. We ask that you watch over and protect and guide it, that you be with both our president and the president-elect and all of their transition teams and allow all to go well there in that transition and keep them both safe according to your will. We pray for all of those within our country, that especially with the unrest in regard to the current election, that people come to their senses and ultimately have uh, uh, righteousness and uh, freedom and uh, peace and love in their hearts so that we go forward as one nation unto you. And Father, we also pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world, and we ask that you be with all those in harm's way, especially in Afghanistan where people and soldiers seem to be losing their lives again uh, day after day, and we ask that you be with them and all of those who are in harm's way and give them uh, peace and comfort and safety in all that they do and also give them assurance within their soul and confidence within their soul by your word and by your spirit. And anyone that's been wounded, we ask for healing. And for those who have given the greatest sacrifice, we thank you, Father, and we ask that you be with their loved ones as well and bring peace and happiness and comfort within their souls. And again, Father, we pray this evening for Wayne Chico and the Chico family and be with Wayne in his surgery tomorrow. We ask that all goes well there and successful surgery and that it be a blessing to him and his family so that ultimately they continue to go forward glorifying you in their bodies. So Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise. In Christ's precious name, amen. <clears throat> all right, if Mary Ellen wouldn't mind coming forward, please. <clears throat> we all want to rise for our doxology. He is Lord, He is Lord, He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He has risen from the dead, and He's my Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for the doxology. And now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. As we continue to note the doctrines uh, that are pertinent to walking worthy uh, by which the calling, uh, so that we honor the calling by which we've been called. Ultimately, we ought to walk in the righteousness of God and not in sin and immorality led by our old sin nature. And we have been also given uh, this new nature that uh, God has created for us from the moment of our salvation, including the new human spirit, so that ultimately we can walk in the righteousness and holiness of God as we walk in the truth, i.e. Bible doctrine, on a consistent basis. And so what we're noting now in verses 25 through 32 are various principles in regard to walking in the new man, putting on the new nature, and laying aside the old man, the old self, the old way of doing things as we were 
in our unbelieving state. And in verse 25, as we noted that on Sunday, we're going to get into verse 26 today uh, and then uh, continue on in the coming days for the rest of these verses. But ultimately in verse 20, uh, 25, we learn that the new man must replace lying with truth telling. And remember, we aren't to be lying, whether that be a little white lie or a big egregious lie. We are not to be doing that. And at the same time, we also understand that this lying has to do with false doctrines, false information that is counted to the will and the word of God. So again, lying or teaching false doctrine is strictly forbidden and something that God looks at, as well as regular type of lying, as something that is an abomination to Him. So let's look at our verses, and uh, we'll come back uh, to the specifics in just a minute. But in verses 25, again, all the way down to 32, we have four major categories, and then the fifth kind of summarizes the whole thing, where we understand these attributes for living in the new man, the new spiritual species that we have been created. In verse 25, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So again, one body in Jesus Christ, but also one member. Uh, one is members of one society. Again, in any country or neighborhood or whatever the case may be. Then in verse 26, we're going to note this this evening. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. That goes along with 26. Now in verse 28, let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor performing with his hands what is good in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. And this is in addition to lying. This is other types of verbal sins are in view. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. <clears throat> So it's kind of interesting as we look at the outline here, and I'll get into verses 31 and 32 and read them in just a minute, but it's interesting how we have a pause in regard to and don't give the devil an opportunity back in verse 27, and then we get down to verse 30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So again, you see the polar opposites there, and as we've been noting in all of these verses, it's telling us what not to do under the old man, and then what to do under the new man. What not to do comes first, and again, what not to do is give the the devil an opportunity. What we should do is not be grieving the Holy Spirit and instead walking in the Spirit, again filled with Him on a consistent basis. In verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Again, many other mental and verbal sins. Then in verse 32, and be kind to one another, this is what to do, tender-hearted or compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So again, we noted verse 25 on Sunday, and even on Sunday, I think I was trying to say that, you know, there's just so much information. Every time I study the Word of God, I first look at the verses and I think, oh, I'm going to get that through that very quickly. And then just the more information comes and more information comes. And again, I've added more information. So tonight we're going to hopefully get in verses 26 and 27, and then I've got a doctrine or outline principle for you on Thursday night. So again, we'll take it as the Spirit gives it to us and ultimately ultimately go forward from there. But again, in regard to the first one in verse 25, stop lying, stop applying false doctrine, stop having false doctrine within our lives, and stop communicating that to each other. Again, in a society, any time you tell people to do things that are counter to the Word of God, you are lying to them because that is not how they should be living. It's not how they should be functioning and operating, but they should be functioning and operating based on the truth of God's Word. And we tell the truth, ultimately we are imitating what God does on a consistent basis, and when we tell the lie, we are imitating Satan himself. As you know, he is the father of lies, he is a murderer from eternity past, and ultimately he's a liar and the father of lies. So when we 
get involved with lying, again, not telling the truth, and especially teaching false doctrines or witnessing false doctrines to our fellow man, ultimately we are imitating Satan and the old nature. But by putting on the new man and recovering from reversionism, where we have been functioning and operating in the lie, false doctrines, and lying within our lives. When we recover from that, ultimately we will have divine viewpoint because we have Bible doctrine within our soul. And remember, what we're seeing here in these passages in verses 25 through 32 are all about that recovery. Because back in verses 17 all the way up until this point, up until verse 25, we've been talking about the blackout of the soul, the scar tissue of the soul, the hardening of the heart, the darkness of the soul. And all that is talking about the reversionistic believer and the reversionistic unbeliever. But ultimately, when we have the truth of God's Word in our lives, we throw off throw off that scar tissue and the blackout of the soul, throw off the old ways of doing things, and then put on the new man and walk in holiness and righteousness. So now we get into verse 26 this evening, where in this passage what we're going to note is that the new man must replace unrighteous anger with righteous anger. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the two forms of anger that we can have within our soul. There is a righteous anger, a righteous indignation, as we can call it, and there's an unrighteous type of anger that we can have within our souls as well. We are commanded not to have the unrighteous anger because that does lead to sin, and it is sin in of itself, and we are told to have righteous indignation or righteous anger from time to time as the, the situation presents itself. But let's look at verse 26 where it says, Be angry, yet do not sin. So again, we can have righteous anger, but do not sin in regard to that anger. And then it goes on to say, to give us a little bit more emphasis, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Again, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And Remember for the Jewish calendar, their sundown was the, was the end of a day. At sunset in the Jewish calendar, in the Jewish time t- uh, table, Ultimately, when the sun would set, that would be the end of one day, and then it would begin another, unlike being midnight, being the change of from one day to the other like we have in our current day time frame and calendar. So basically, what the Word of God is telling us, deal with the anger that you have within your soul, even that righteous indignation, or even if it's unrighteous anger, deal with it in that day and leave it at that. Don't carry it on to the next day and the next day and the next day. Don't let it fester within your soul. That's the principle that we have here in regard to this righteous versus unrighteous anger that we are to be having. Now this verse, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26, is actually a quote from Psalm chapter 4 verse 4 where it says, Be angry and do not sin. So again, we have the same principle, Old Testament, New Testament. And then uh, the second half of Psalm chapter 4, verse 4, ultimately is, I'd say, a commentary on what we have here in Ephesians. In Ephesians, it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In Psalm, it says, meditate within your heart, on your bed, and be still. In other words, when the day is closed and ultimately you go to bed, that's when you are to meditate. In other words, pray to the Lord. Think about the things that happened during that day and turn them over to the Lord in your prayer life and in your thought process, your conversations with God. And what? Be still. In other words, let the anger go. Don't let it carry on from one day to the other because it is just going to be more of a problem the next day than it was in the first day. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into this in some detail. Also, we see these same principles in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 15, where it says, You shall give him his wages on his day before the sun sets. Ultimately, if you were to hire somebody and have them work for you, again in the ancient time, uh, during the time of Israel, you were to pay them that very day. I know we have payroll in our societies today, and we get paid once a week or twice a week, or or, excuse me, uh, uh, once every two weeks, or once a month, whatever the case may be. And we understand that principle and precept, and that's okay to do that as well. But the fact is, is that when somebody earns a wage, we should be paying them that wage. And it says, before the sun sets. Then it goes on and gives us a little bit more understanding of what this is all about. It says, for he is poor and sets his heart 
on it, his daily wage that he has earned. He needs those things so that he may not cry against you to the Lord and it becomes sin in you. So again, if you're not paying your employees on the allotted time frame, whether that be once a week or every two weeks or once a month, and you're withholding their wages, that too is a sinful thing back to you. And what have you done? You've caused someone else to have anger within their soul. Again, that's the crying out to the Lord. You've caused somebody else to operate and function in sin because now they're having a difficulty making ends meet. So when we compare Deuteronomy 24.15 with Psalm 4.4 and our verse, basically what the Lord is trying to say is deal with all your problems and your situations, your obligations and your debts, reconcile them all in the time frame in which you should be doing that. Again, if it's anger upon your soul, each and every day. If it hasn't happened to be a wage, maybe you do pay them every day, but other times maybe you'll pay them once a week or every two weeks or once a month, whatever the allotted schedule is for that payment. That is okay. But again, reconcile all your debts when they are incurred. And don't let these things fester. Don't let it boil over to the next day. Don't let it drag on because it just creates more and more problem within a society. Rather than putting them off to another day, deal with them right now. Because not only is it harming you in your soul, but it's harming the other person as well that you may be dealing with or functioning with and operating towards. So again, if you have a debt which includes sins that might have been committed against you or a sin that you have committed against someone else, reconcile that in that day. Don't let it bleed over to the next day and the next day and the next day. If you've got a problem with somebody or you've got a problem with something, deal with it that day. Address it. Have a conversation. Pay the wage that's that's due. And then also reconcile that within the heart of your soul and turn it over to the Lord. Again, reconcile that with the Lord as well. And make sure that you are okay with the Lord and you're not letting this thing Uh, linger and prolong and keep going on and on and on and on. And again, you can see within our nation, we had an election. It was a week ago uh, today that the election happened, and people are still lingering over the outcome. They still think that, you know, they can change the outcome or change the effect of the outcome. And they are protesting and creating even more agita and anxiety. And the media is feeding into all of this and ultimately making this country have more anxiety and agita and anger within their soul because it keeps going day after day after day. And the funny thing was, if the media just stopped and applied the principle of the Word of God and covered it one day and said, that's it, we're done with it, these people wouldn't get out. Because the only reason they're getting out is because they want to be on TV and they want to be for the cause and they want to do this and they want to do that. And they let it fester and the anger within their soul. Okay, if you want to go protest, go protest one day and then let it be done. Okay, if you can't get your word across in that day, then let it be done. Again, turn it over to the Lord. And the fact of the matter is all these protesters are basically just taking matters into their own hand, thinking that they are the you know, captain of their ship. Well, we have to recognize that God is the captain of our ship, and He's the captain of this country, and He's the captain of the world. Ultimately, what these people are showing is no faith rest in God, no trust in God. As I I shared with you on Sunday, Romans chapter 13, that God is the one who ordains everybody to be in the political positions that they hold. Everybody in power, everybody who is a ruler over a country or a state or even a town has been placed there by the Lord. It's part of His will from eternity past. And you think in your little feebleness and your humanity that you're going to change those things or that you should fight against those things? Ultimately, what you have to recognize is that God put that in power and God put that in place. And if you're not right with God, then you're going to be angry, you're going to protest, you're going to let it fester, and you're not going to deal with it. And ultimately, it's just going to be detrimental and harmful to you in the long run. So in any case, when we have a situation that's going on, don't let it fester. Don't let it bleed over to the next day because not only are you hurting yourself, but you're hurting the other people that are around you that you may be in communication with in regard to these things. And ultimately, there becomes no peace and no happiness within a society as a result. So the improper use of anger results from 
yielding to the old sin nature, the old Adamic nature, the human nature, the human works, the evil, all of these things. Again, the improper use of these things are because you are letting the old sin nature run rampant within your soul. You're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. You're not yielding to the Word of God. You don't have faith rest in God and His great power and authority and His great will and plan for not only your life, but for the history of human race. Remember, Jesus Christ controls history. Yes, Satan may be the ruler of this world, but he's not ruling anything unless Jesus Christ gives him authority to do so. And when we have a client nation like ours and we have duly elected officials in a fair and righteous way, we absolutely recognize and understand that God has ordained the position for these individuals to be in that they have won in the election. So let's look at that word anger a little bit. Again, be angry. It's the uh, Greek word orgizomai. Uh, that's how I should pronounce it, orgizomai. And ultimately it talks about an inner mental attitude of indignation, wrath, hatred, and fury. And again, all of those words, when you think about those, again, you know, it's just, you know, creating a fever pitch. It's just creating some kind of mentality that is just off the charts, the boiling over, the burning, and the anger of sensation that is going on. And this word is uh, used in a specific way when it's dealing with people, things, or even events. And you can see this used in Numbers chapter 22, 22, and Proverbs chapter 16 in verse 30. And it's interesting that generally we are commanded not to be angry in the first place in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, as well as Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Again, the parallel verse to what we have here. And it's interesting in this chapter 4 that we have how Colossians chapter 3 is almost a mirror image of what we're seeing in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. So again, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians that we call the letter to the Ephesians, but ultimately it was to the overall church, when he wrote to the church at Colossia, he wrote very similar things to make sure that the word got out there. But in any case, generally we are commanded not to have anger in the first place. There really isn't much we should be angry about in this life because God is providing for us, God is giving to us, and God and Jesus Christ have things in control. But yet we also can understand that there is a righteous anger from time to time. But in regard to not being angry, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, and again, that's an old Aramaic term, uh, ultimately, that means empty-headed, numbskull, senseless, fool. We could also say jackass, if you want to add that to it, in some of the uh, Greek definitions I've seen for this. Again, they shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, again, the Supreme Court of Heaven, and whoever shall say, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So isn't that interesting? Just using words like that to condemn your fellow brother that they are an idiot or they're stupid or they don't know what they're saying and to use hard language like that against someone else ultimately is enough to condemn them to hell because what? It's a sin. So we shouldn't even have that type of word. Again, that, again the, the old Aramaic slang word, raka, it wasn't part of the Greek language nor the Hebrew language, but it was part of the Aramaic language that all these other Greeks and Hebrews recognized and understood what this word meant. Again, a slang, you know, derogatory word that you would call another individual. So again, we should not be angry to the point where we are name-calling one another. Ultimately, we should be using common sense and using words that edify, as we're going to see uh, a little bit later on. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Get rid of all those things. You see, the Christian should not be functioning and operating with a mouth that is full of filth. A Christian should not be operating based on the anger that is in their soul especially when it is in regards to things that don't have much to do with the Word of God and Bible doctrine. 
So again, if somebody is, you know, says something to you, again, you shouldn't spout off and let your top flow, a uh, top blow off just because they've said something to you or about you. Again, you should turn it over to the Lord. Again, the Lord is going to deal with things. The Lord is going to deal with evil. If you think something's evil in this world, the Lord is going to deal with that evil much better than you could ever deal with that evil. And all your little, you know, human efforts and human works and all those things to try to fight evil in that sense, don't you think the Lord can do a much better job at it than you? Again, we are not to roll over to evil, and that's what we're going to see in uh, this next point in regard to our righteous anger and righteous indignation. Again, we don't roll over and just let evil take over. And again, when I say evil, I mean true evil. You see, many people think a person or personality is evil because it isn't according to what they like. That is not evil. Just because somebody has different viewpoints and opinions from you does not make them evil. What is evil is found in the Word of God. What is righteous is found in the Word of God. That's how you can determine what is evil and what is righteous, not based on whether they agree with your thought process or not. So again, when we have anger, we, are to have, we can have righteous indignation against sin and evil found in the Word of God. And we see that, that uh, the word anger that I gave to you, again, orgizomai, is used in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, Mark chapter 3, 5, Romans 1, 18, and then also Romans chapter 12, verse 19, for God. You see, God does have anger. He does have wrath. He does have righteous indignation, but yet we also know that God does not have sin. And what does God have anger towards? What does He have wrath towards and indignation towards? Against true sin and evil. Things that are legitimately evil, things that are legitimately sinful. So anger in itself is not sinful. But again, it can be easily become sin if we don't deal with it right away. So our Lord demonstrated this type of righteous indignation when He went into the temple, when they were using the Lord's house as what? A place of profit. And it was all about selling the doves and the goats and the lambs and all the other animals for the sacrifices. It was all about that and making money and profit off of the feasts and festivals of Israel that God had commanded them to participate in and then also sacrifice for. And remember, you know, men were coming from all over the world, traveling days or weeks or even months on end to get to the temple for the high holidays, especially the three, including the Passover. And they would come from all over the world. So instead of them bringing along with them the sacrifice necessary, it was much easier for them to just go to Jerusalem and then buy it there and then bring it to the temple. So again, there is legitimacy, but what they were doing was setting up the temple inside the temple itself to have this money exchange hands. And then, as you know, the Lord also knew that the heart of these people weren't right because their sacrifices weren't recognizing the giving of the Messiah and what the Messiah, Savior, would do, who was now right in front of them, the Lord Jesus Christ. But theirs was all just about doing human works, human good, and just doing religious in their sacrifice. So what did our Lord do? He got angry about that because they were using the Passover, using the temple to make a profit, and their heart was not right. So there was sin and evil and wickedness going on there. And our Lord went in not once, but twice during his three and a half year ministry. And he kicked the people out of there and turned the money tables over. We see that in Matthew 21, 12, Mark chapter 11, 15. And then in the, the first time in John chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. The Matthew and Mark are just before our Lord was crucified. And again, that was one of the other reasons why they finally got rid of him, because he went in and did it again, and the Pharisees had had enough for him. So they, you know, were, uh, this was just another thing, another, you know, it was a straw on the camel's back, as they say ultimately to get him and get rid of him. But in John chapter 2, that's the account at the beginning of his ministry. Right after the wedding of Cana, at the beginning of his ministry, he went in and he tried to cleanse the temple because at that point they you know, were using it in a very evil way. And this was also prophesied in Psalm chapter 69, verse 9. 
So there are times when you should have righteous indignation. And when is that? Well, when people are teaching false doctrines that are absolutely counter to the Word of God. When people are sinning in your presence absolutely to the counter of the Word of God. Or people are giving wholehearted agreement to sin and other people sinning when it's counter to the Word of God. That's when you can have righteous anger and righteous indignation. But at the same time, what do you need to do? You need to deal with it right away. Deal with it right away. And you aren't, a lot, uh, you, you know, we are not commanded to let it bleed over to the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And again, as the passage says, you know, every day has enough trouble of its own. Why worry about tomorrow? Each day has enough trouble of its own. So again, in our world and our society today, every day is going to have a new thing for you to have righteous indignation. And if you don't deal with it in that day by applying divine viewpoint and then turning it over to the Supreme Court of Heaven and let God deal with it rather than you and your pettiness trying to deal with it, ultimately, if you don't do that, you're going to be operating in sin. So, again, we should hate sin just like God hates sin in Psalm chapter 119, verse 53, and also in Galatians chapter 4, 16. Remember, God hates sin. We had the list of the seven sins in Proverbs chapter 6 that I gave you on Sunday that are an abomination to the Lord that He hates, and they are an abomination. And we, too, should hate those things just as much. We, too, should not want to be in the presence of sinful acts and sinful things. And, oh, by the way, let me just... Put, put this out, and I probably should uh, mention this on Sunday. Hopefully, you know, uh, people that aren't here that do show on Sunday, I know they, uh, many of them are online tonight, so hopefully uh, uh, they get this. But, you know, we just passed a law in this state where we legalize mar- marijuana. I mean, how idiotic is that? I mean, when you think about it, you know, we said no to enhancing our education for our children, and we said yes that they can all go out and smoke pot. I mean, just think about that, you know? And again, that's when you can have some righteous indignation because we are going to have a society that now is legalized to smoke marijuana, which is absolutely against the Word of God. You know, there's a word that we see translated in typically the New American Standard Bible called sorcery. And you know what that Greek word is? I've given it to you before. It's called pharmakita, where we get our word pharmaceutical from. And what does it talk about? Not witch potions and things like that, but it's talking about drug abuse. Drug abuse, which alcohol is another type of drug, again, can be abused. Ultimately, we are now saying that it's okay in our country, in our society, to smoke marijuana. But you know what? Even though, God, even though the society says it's okay, God does not say it's okay. So you don't have the right to go smoke marijuana as a Christian because your state says it's okay. Nor should you give wholehearted agreement to other people smoking marijuana or even drinking to excess and being drunk all the time. You should not be giving wholehearted agreement to that, nor even associating with those type of people, because that means you're giving wholehearted agreement to uh, to that. And you too will be sinning as a result just by standing by and agreeing or, you know, not having that righteous indignation and not even leaving the scene and, and or even, you know, telling the truth of what the Word of God has to say, that smoking marijuana and getting drunk are against the Word of God called pharmakia. And if you want to throw in the sorcery, that just gives a little spice to it. Because now it's like a witch doctor or the witch's brew and all of that coming forward and the, you know, the, 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 you know, the magical potion that gets whipped up and you know, uh, everything else that goes along with that. You could throw that in there if you like. Okay? That sorcery is kind of a King James, old English type of terminology that uh, even the modern translations have kept. But ultimately, it's all about drug abuse. So there are things, and again, the idiocy of our society to vote in things that are going to negatively affect the mentality of the soul, open up the sin nature wide for Satan to go in and the old sin nature to take over and to have it legalized. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And yet to further the education of our children, we all voted no. Okay, now I shouldn't say we all, but again... The majority voted no. Let's not better our kids' education. Let's get them all high on dope. And you say, oh, well, well, they can't smoke till they're 21. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, they're already doing it now when it's illegal. Now when it's legal, don't you think it's going to be that much easier? Absolutely. So in any case, and then you're going to see parents smoking in front of the kids, and you know, now the kids are going to want to smoke it too. So again, you know, just a detrimental thing and a, you know, a downward spiral within a society. Hopefully we'll learn in a couple of years that the negative aspects, I'm going off on a rant here, but we'll learn the negative aspects about this in a couple of years and, and we can overturn this maybe uh, in future elections. But again, right now we are set with what we have set, but just because it's legalized you know, here or anywhere within the country doesn't mean you have the right to do it. It's still against the Word of God. So again, we should hate sin. Just like God hates sin, we should hate all things that lead to sin as well, just as God hates all things that lead to sin and have that righteous indignation. But at the same time, we can't let it fester. Psalm chapter 119, verse 53, David said, Burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. And again, this was just going against the law of the Old Testament, the wicked who have forsaked it. Again, David had righteous anger because he hated people seeing. He hated seeing people function and operate against the law. As we would say today, against the Word of God. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And again, by telling the truth, and have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? I mean, it's almost like, you know, you could add to this, so be it. You know, if that's the way the chips are going to fall, let the chips fall in that place. But at the same time, in your righteous indignation, you can be in, in front of people and say, what you're doing is sinful and wrong. And it's according to the Word of God. And when you do it, please give Scripture. It's kind of like what I was telling you about, about the protesters and the, you know, the back and forth on Facebook and stuff. You know, don't go back and forth point to point to point to point because all you're doing is sharing different viewpoints of opinion. And that doesn't go anywhere. And people can argue that till the cows come home. But give Scripture. That seals the deal. And then if they don't agree, at least you've told them the truth. And if you've become their enemy by telling them the truth, then that's okay. And you can be at rest in your soul. Because they're not angry with you, they're angry with God and the Word of God. And let them fight that battle, you know. And again, turn it over to the Lord. Let them fight God, you know. Just think about that a little bit. You know, we're all up in arms to fight this battle and fight that battle and right this wrong and right that wrong. And again, we are to have righteous indignation. But again, Jesus only did it really twice, Okay. He only did it twice, and very egregious things were going on. So again, choose your, your, your places wisely. But for the most part, turn it over to the Lord. Even when you are choosing your place, you know, turn it over to the Lord before you get to that place of speaking and opening your mouth or leaving a scene because you're not, you don't like what's going on. And let everybody know why you're leaving. You don't have to stomp out and take your ball and go home. Tell everybody why in a very peaceful and comfortable way, saying, this is wrong according to God's word, and here's why. And I don't want to participate in that. Thank you very much. So I'm going to excuse myself right now. Again, whatever the case, get the message across. Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? So, yet anger is never to be allowed to fester, whether it be righteous indignation or, again, even the as sinful anger that we can have. Again, if anger becomes sin within your soul, you know you have an answer to that. 1 John 1, 9, confess the sin, have the cleansing of your soul once again, be filled with the Spirit, and move on. And don't keep going back over that thing over and over and over again. Don't let it fester. And if it's righteous indignation, God doesn't even want that to fester in your soul because it can easily become, what? Sin. And, you know, it might have started out as a good thing, but if you let it go without trusting in God, turning it over to God, even though it was a righteous thing for you, Satan can take that and twist it around, and now it's sin within your life. And then next thing you know, you're fighting for a cause, or you're, you know, being a holy roller, as they like to call, and crusader arrogance, as Pastor Theme used to say. And now you've got this crusader arrogance where you're going to right the wrongs of the world. Again, turn it over to the Lord. You know, there's times to act, there's times to speak up, but even with that, it's turning it over to the Lord and letting it rest in the Lord. 
So again, we should never allow it to be fester. Why? It says, and yet do not sin. If you let the anger fester, it will eventually become sin. Because your anger won't be satisfied. You ever notice that? When your anger is not satisfied, what does it do? It leads to more anger and more anger and more anger. And you want to get people back and you want to do this and you want to do that. If you don't deal with your anger, even though it's righteous indignation, it will eventually turn to sin because you can't get no satisfaction, as, they used to, as the stone said in the song. Okay, You can't get no satisfaction. But when you turn it over to the Lord, you've got satisfaction. Because it's his battle, not yours. And he'll lead you when he wants you to open your mouth and fight the battle for him. And you'll be totally at peace when doing that. You won't be emotional. You won't be all freaked out. You won't have any emotional revolt of the soul. It won't be your you know, uh, feelings or your emotions worn on your sleeve. You'll be at calm, peace, and rest. And you will speak when the time comes. Or you'll act when the time comes. But prior to that, because you've turned it over to the Lord, you will have satisfaction because you'll turn it over to the Supreme Court of Heaven. Again, you know the Supreme Court in our land is the highest decision-making body in our country. And once they make a decision, it's final. Same goes with God. You turn it over to God, let Him make the final decision on whatever you may be angry with or about. Let Him make the final decision. And oh, by the way, it will be a better decision than you could ever imagine. It will be a better outcome than you could ever imagine. But when you are operating in anger and you're letting it fester and not turning it over to the Lord, you're going to have wrong outcomes. And even though what you might have thought was you know, the best vengeance that you could have on somebody, ultimately it's just going to hurt you and it won't even have an effect on the other party. So again, turn it over to the Lord. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now, I just want to give you these two Greek words. Again, the first anger that we had, that it said, be angry, yet do not sin. Again, it's orgizomai. The second anger, where it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, ultimately, it's a cognate of that. It puts the prefix para on the front of it. So again, para orgismos is the Greek word that we have here. But it's the same root word, which is orge, O-R-G-E, is the root for all of these. It just basically is anger or wrath. But here we have a, a, a para, orgizmas, which puts the prefix on it. And, when you, and uh, in the definition of this word, it means provocation, anger, rage, wrath, and ex... Uh, uh, at, uh, no, I've forgotten this word. Exasperation, okay? Exasperation, that's how you say that word, okay? Lost it there for a minute. But exasperation, okay? And that's a good way to think about this word, exasperation. And you're exasperated, which means, again, you've lost all your strength. You've lost all your power. You've, you've totally just, you know, you, you just don't know what to do. And there's no satisfaction. There's no peace and happiness and contentment. Now, the interesting aspect about putting para, the preposition on the front of this, is that preposition in the Greek means side by side, okay? So what we have before us is anger by anger, and that's what this second one means. Don't let the sun go down on your anger by anger is kind of a literal way of saying it. But again, what it's talking about is the multiplication of your anger, where more anger comes, and now it becomes sin. We would call this compounding our sins, okay? And that's why this Greek word paraorgismos is used here, because now if we let the sun go down and we still are angry, it now has multiplied itself. It's sin upon sin, anger upon anger, well, side by side, and ultimately we have multitude of sin now within our soul. We have multiple things going on. Maybe you had uh, jealousy now come into the fore. You had righteous indignation. Now you have jealousy or bitterness or implacability or some other form of mental attitude sin some, or gossip or malign or slander because of your anger. Or you've acted out and you've committed murder or stolen something, or as we're seeing throughout uh, several cities in our country because of the election, again, they're creating damage to property and looting stores and all kinds of things like that. So what might have started out for the protesters as righteous indignation has now led to a multiplication of sin within their life. 
And the same goes for you and I as believers, as members of the royal family and having a royal family honor code. Every day you should let that anger go by turning it over to the Lord. And maybe let it go by having dealt with it. If there's a problem with somebody else, give them the word of God or, you know, uh, you know uh, pay the debt that you owe. Maybe you've sinned against somebody and that's created your anger to uh, stir up a little bit more. And maybe you were angry in that sin and you hold on to that anger. Deal with that person right then and there. Reconcile with them. Say you're sorry, whatever the case may be. But deal with it in that day. That's the honor code for the royal family, that we deal with things in time, in a short period of time. We don't let it fester. And more importantly, we are turning it over to the Lord and absolutely faith resting in Him to deal with that thing, not only for our sakes and in our lives, but also in the lives of the other people, a thing that we may be angry with. So a characteristic of the new man is also found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 in regard to all of this where we have control over our souls. You see, when you let anger out of its box, it starts to take over control of your soul. And now you're led by your anger because now the emotions are kicking in and other, other sins are now kicking in. Now you have done what? Lost control of your soul. And now you're being led by your emotions, you're being led by the old sin nature, and you have no control over your soul now. And God knows what could happen, you know? There are many people in jail today because they have committed crimes because of an outburst of anger. One moment of anger has landed them in jail and some for life because they've murdered somebody as a result. One moment of anger. So again, that's why we need to have control over our soul. And when we have control over our soul, then we can be angry in righteous indignation where we aren't losing control of our soul. We understand the issues. We understand the Word of God. We understand that He is dealing with that thing and we've turned it over to Him. And we are understanding how we should respond in a righteous way to that situation. That's how the royal family needs to deal with problems and difficulties within their life. Having control over your soul rather than letting the soul run wild with the emotions and old sin nature being in control. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says, In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. So we take it all the way back. From your knowledge, you gain godliness. From knowledge, you gain self-control, which means you have godliness. From self-control, again, you have perseverance. And again, you can withstand. You know, yeah, we've got a president. We've elected a new president. He's only there for four years. Then there's another election. He could be voted out. And at worst case, eight years. Have perseverance. You can survive four to eight years, can't you? I think you can. You know, those who didn't like the past president, we lasted eight years. We had perseverance during that time frame. We didn't kick and scream and, you know, you know, uh, you know take our ball and go home and ultimately, you know, mope and whine because of that presidency. No, we turned it over to the Lord. We pray for that individual. We ask for God's guidance. We ask for God's protection. We ask for God to lead, even in, regard, uh, uh, even in, in, in view of where that individual uh, thinks or how they think and how they function and how they operate. We persevere. And why is that? Because we have knowledge. We have knowledge of the Word of God. We have knowledge of the spiritual life. We have knowledge of the Christ-like nature. And with that knowledge, you can overcome anything. You can withstand anything. You can persevere. Remember, when all this was written, again, 2,000 years ago, when Paul was writing all of these things, who was in charge? A Roman emperor who thought they were God. The most evil type of person and personality you could think of. That guy Nero. You ever, do, ever uh, hear about Nero and the, you know, the things that he did and the evil that he did? Caliglia, you've heard of that emperor, how evil and rotten he was. Again, they persevered. And they couldn't vote those guys in or out every four to eight years. Once they were in, they were there till they died or they decided to step down. So again, they had no control over that. They didn't have an opportunity to vote. So again, what a difference. And yet you see the, the you know, the, the, indignation that is boiled over to sin 
within their lives. So again, self-control, perseverance, and then ultimately godliness. But again, when there's no God in a country, you get some of the things that we're getting today. You get the evil, you get the wickedness, you get the rottenness, you get bad decisions, you get bad uh, 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 voting in regard to smoking marijuana and things like that. And oh, by the way, this is the state that voted for the other candidate, if you know that. But ultimately, you get bad decisions. Bad decisions after bad decisions after bad decisions. So, as we know, angry, anger should be dealt with or taken care of immediately in one of the three ways that we have in this passage. Number one, don't let it be sin. First and foremost, never let your anger lead to sin. Don't let it become bitter, jealous, vengeful, Gossip, maligning, slandering, stealing, murdering. Don't let it fester into something else. Again, always have your anger in check where you don't like something and you recognize why you don't like it because it's against the Word of God. You turn it over to the Lord and you pray about that and you ask for the Lord's guidance in that thing. Lord, should I say something? Lord, should I do something? Lord, what you, would you have me or what should I just be still? What should I do? Remember when the, uh, uh, the Egyptians were coming after the Israelites when they came out of captivity and they had their back up against the Red Sea? They all started what? Freaking out. They all started getting angry. Moses, did you lead us out here just so we could die in the wilderness? And what did Moses say? Stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord for you today. Talk about a faith rest drill. Talk about a faith rest life. Stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord for you today. And that's how we should live each and every day. Watch and watch. You know, stand still and watch. Be still and watch. Watch what God can do. You know, turn it over to Him. He can do much greater things than any of us and all of us collectively could even imagine we could do. Oh yeah, and by the way, what does that go back to? Chapter 3, The Life Beyond Dreams. He can do beyond all that you can ask or that you can even think. Again, He can do so much more. So why do we take our anger and let it fester and turn into sin? Why, why, why? Again, because we have no doctrine and we're letting the sin nature control. So number one, do not let it become sin. Have control over your soul. And if you have sinned during the process, confess it. And then turn away from that sin and that mentality and go forward in God's plan. Number two, do not let the sun go down without resolving it. And again, resolving it means you've either reconciled with the person that you might have had a problem or difficulty with, or you've turned it over to the Lord in absolute faith rest. Again, don't let the sun go down. And then number three, and this is what we're really going to be talking about on Thursday night, and I'm going to try to introduce a few of these points tonight as well, but don't give the devil an opportunity. You see, every time you have anger that leads to sin, you've opened up that soul to the old sin nature and Satan in his cosmic system. And as you as a believer, he's going to take that opportunity every chance he gets to just drive you down, drive you further away from God, and get you into some form of mentality where you are just totally going away from God's word, will, and plan for your life. You've given him an opportunity. So let's talk about that. Let's look at verse 27, where again, you know, uh, back in verse 25, we have two sins again, you know, therefore lay aside falsehood, speak truth, instead speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then why? Because you'll give the devil an opportunity. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't give Satan an opportunity to take control of your soul because he absolutely will each and every chance that he gets. So what we're seeing in verse 27 is the consequences of not dealing with our sins. That's what's in view here. If we don't deal with our sins in a righteous way and in a holy way, if we don't confess them to the Lord and turn them over to God and take our anger and turn it over to Him, ultimately we're not dealing with our sins, with our problems, or with our difficulties. And again, if we don't deal with them through Him and with Him immediately, ultimately our 
soul and now heart is opened up to Satan and his cosmic system. Now what's happening, rather than righteousness coming in and the light of God coming into your soul, you've got darkness coming in. You've got the matayotes. You've got the void in your soul. You've got the, uh, the darkness on the left lobe, the hardness on the right lobe. Again, you've got the callous nature going on on the intake and then the application when you don't deal with your sins in a righteous way consistently. And we give the devil an opportunity. And that's the consequences when we don't deal with them in the righteous way that God has asked us to deal with, uh, deal, uh, deal with them. And I just said, ask, I should take that up a notch. Because I haven't really talked about this too much, but every one of these passages is in the imperative mood. Imperative mood, which is a command. So what we're seeing here is command after command after command after command after command. In other words, he's not asking us, oh, if you get around to it, could you do this? He's saying this is what you absolutely should be doing and what you absolutely ought to be doing. And so that's what we need to recognize and understand, that these are mandates from God as to how to function and operate in the spiritual life. So how do we give Satan the opportunity? Well, ultimately by opening up our sin nature, letting the old man out, letting him run wild, letting him exploit the situation, taking advantage of you know, the mentality of our soul, whether it be emotional revolt of the soul or just the sin nature lust patterns and control of our soul, whether it be for human good or immorality. Again, you, we talked about the sin nature. We know the lust patterns. We've opened that up and Satan will take advantage. And then ultimately what even might have started as a right thing now becomes a wrong thing. That's why a kernel theme, you know, I love the coin, you know, the, the, the coin or the, what am I saying, the coin, the turning of the coinage of the terms, whatever, the ter coin phrase, coin of a phrase, that's what I'm trying to say. And he always would say, yeah, you got to do a right thing in a right way. If you do a right thing in a wrong way, it's wrong. If you do a wrong thing in a right way, it's wrong. If you do a wrong thing in a wrong way, two wrongs don't make a right, it's wrong. We need to do a right thing in a right way. Otherwise, we open ourselves up to sin and Satan. So again, he will exploit the situation when we let sin and evil overtake our soul. That phrase, the devil here, interestingly, it doesn't just say Satan here. It says the devil. And that's diablos in the uh, Greek language. And that means slanderer, false accuser, adversary. And this was the term that was given to Satan, also known as Lucifer as well. This is the term that was given to him as a title because he is a slanderer. Again, he makes false accusations. He's a false accuser. He loves to run people down and run them through the mud. He is our adversary, especially as believers in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this word slander or false accuser, we go back to our two phrases of do not lie. The liar is like the devil because he's a, a, a false accuser. He's a liar too. The one that gets angry and allows it to become sin, ultimately he becomes an adversary. He becomes a slanderer in that way because ultimately he'll start to act out the anger within his soul. So again, the devil, diabolos, slanderer, false accuser, adversary. These are all titles that have been given to Satan himself. Again, Lucifer. And what may have started out as righteous indignation has now been easily turned because you didn't deal with it into sin. And that type of sin of bitterness, of vengeance of, that I mentioned before, if you don't deal with it right then and there. So again, very important for us to deal with these things and not let them fester. If we let it go and go and go and go, ultimately it is going to become sin within our soul. And then that sin could just lead us down that dark path. We're now the, again, false doctrines are coming into our soul. False presets and concepts from the world are coming into our soul. Again, the void of doctrine now starts to take over. Blackout of the soul, scar tissue of the soul, all that starts to take over. And Satan now has us. And that's the road to reversionism, leading ultimately to apostasy as well. And it starts with carnality, sinning. So if we take care of the sin from day one by confessing it and recovering, going forward in the plan of God, it won't become reversionism or apostasy. But if we let it go, ultimately it will 
turn into even darker and uglier places within our soul. And so the sin nature and Satan's cosmic system are designed to turn your righteousness into sin. Again, designed to turn your righteousness into sin. And this is why religion is so popular, because Satan has taken the things of the Word of God and made it into a system of human works. He did it with the Pharisees during the days of Jesus, and he's doing it in Christianity with the major denominations and religions that we have throughout the world today. He takes from the truth and he twists it, so now it becomes human good within your soul, and now it becomes sin and evil. So again, uh, the cosmic system is designed to take what might have started as righteous, but then ultimately turn it into evil. And that's what they try to do with our righteousness, with your righteousness. So again, if, you're not, if you start out in a good way and you're doing a right thing, deal with it rightly right then and there and don't let it become a wrong way. Don't do a right thing in a wrong way because Satan has taken hold of your soul because you've allowed it to turn into sin, uh, evil and vengeance and bitterness and implacability and all those other things that we've already noted. So let me leave you this and then one scripture. To deal with our anger, again, turn it over to God just so you get this down in the points, and then also reach out to reconcile with those that you have a debt with, okay? Reach out to them and try to have a good conversation that edifies one another and, start, and stop, you know, you know uh, dissing each other, as we call it in our society today, making fun of each other, calling names, and, you know, and not listening either. You know, part of reaching out is listening to what other people have to say. And when you listen, then you can determine, is this a righteous thing or is this an unrighteous thing? And then you can respond with righteousness. So again, you know, deal with it. First and foremost, always turn it over to God and then try to reconcile before the sun goes down, as it says, so that ultimately we don't have problems and difficulties that fester and then become sin within our lives. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And again, so far as it depends on you. Yeah, you're not going to be friends with everybody. Not everybody's going to be at peace with you because they're not going to like what you think. But that doesn't give you an excuse to be vengeful and bitter and anger and implacable and gossip, malign and slander and name call and all these other verbal types of sins. Again, that doesn't give you an excuse to do that. Again, be at peace with all men so far as it depends on you means operating in self-control perseverance, take the hit if you need to take the hit from time to time, and then ultimately operate in righteousness as you faith rest in God in all things. All right, so I'm going to leave it there, and then on Thursday night we're going to come back and I'm going to give you the outline of Satan and his strategies to overrun your soul. Okay, so we're going to talk about that on Thursday night. So pray for me. All right, so in any case, uh, let's just uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for helping us to understand what righteousness truly is and how we should be functioning and operating uh, you know, in anger and without anger and how to deal with it. And Father, we can't thank you enough for your word that does provide us peace, happiness, and comfort, and especially your joy. Again, the happiness of God plus H that we have within our souls. We thank you for giving us that by your word and by your spirit. So, Father, we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.